welcome to the Shot Maker Podcast. This podcast is all about you and your mindset. There are so many things out there that we can't control, but this podcast is all about digging into what we can control and learning from operators, owners, thought leaders who all believe that it is all about mindset. Welcome to the Shot Maker Podcast. I am joined today by Trip Ravine, founder of Barley Creek Brewing Company. Trip, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm delighted to be here, and I would be remiss if I didn't say um, co-founder, because uh, my wife, Eileen, yes. you know, is, is really much more talented than I am. <laughs> yes, no, uh, definitely. <laughs> Thanks. No, we're so excited to be here. For those of you that don't know, Barley Creek sits at the base of the Kilvac Mountain in the Pocono Mountain area and is an iconic brand. I think so many people that come skiing here, that vacation here, know you, know your story. So share with us a little bit about your vision of Barley Creek when you started it. Like, what did you think it would be and all that? Thanks. Yeah, it's, um, you know, when we started, it was 26 years ago. So we opened up in uh, 1995 and I had a little bit of a uh, finance background. So I was able to go ahead and put a business plan together. I had a friend who opened up uh, a brew pub up in Portland, Maine, about eight years before me. So the beginning of the brewing industry and it's Gritty McDuff's. And I asked uh, my buddy, hey, would you help me open this up? And he said, yes, that's the only <laughs> help I got, except um, he was encouraging. And uh, he encouraged me to go go ahead and pursue this dream of, of being an independent, uh, you know, um, entrepreneurial uh, operator of a brew pub. And so we found a piece of property in the Poconos on the road to Camelback Ski Area and very close to a pretty large retail outlet mall complex. And we kind of saw this happen uh, in Portland, Maine, at the mouth of the Sunny River Ski Area, there's a Sunny River Brewing Company. Okay. And up in uh, Freeport, Maine, there's the uh, Freeport um, Outlets, and there was a, a brewery there. I thought, well, if the brewery at the Outlets is doing well in Maine, and if the brewery at the ski area in Maine is doing well, I've got a location where there's a ski area and an outlet on the same road. So that's that's how we picked this location. And uh, we haven't regretted it. It's been a really good location. And our ultimate goal is just to make quality beer and now quality spirits because we're a small distillery. And the other interesting part of the uh, success equation or survival equation <laughs> is to reinvest every year so that the guest comes back and thinks, wow, that's new, or boy, that's different, or that's better. I mean, every once in a while, they'll come back and say, I didn't really like that. So the sushi bar is gone. Right. <laughs> the, the, the oyster bar is gone. So we've made mistakes, but we learn from them. And we have fun uh, going to the, you know, the restaurant show in Chicago. We have fun going to the show in uh, New York City, the food show there. We have fun... Uh, you know, going to the craft brewers conference or the you know American distilling conference. So wherever we can get good ideas from other people having fun, we're going to try and have more fun. Nice. Yeah. So what do you think, because you started when, you know, brewers were coming on, there was lots of competition. And then obviously there was a time where, you know, the industry was really hurt in the early 2000s. What do you think made you guys stay and, you know, stay consistent with your brand throughout all of the craziness of the last you know, 25 years? Well, when we first opened up, almost every optometrist opened up a brewery, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they didn't get it. I had worked for a British bank, and so I kind of knew what a proper pint was. And I also had a, uh, you know, that mentor uh, from Gritty McDuff's gave me a lead to Peter Austin. When Peter Austin is Alan Pugsley, and that's the brewing system that we've got. And the ultimate goal is, how's the beer? Yeah. Now you say, well, how's the beer? What does that mean? Well, if you finish that beer and you order the same one, <laughs> that means it was a good beer. Right. That means you're, you're willing to do that one again. So right. how's the beer? As long as you're making a quality product and you are working hard to make that product uh, consistent and maybe a little bit better each year, you're going to outlast the optometrist. 
<laughs> no, that's a very valuable, valuable lesson. Or, or as you can say, I see. Right. <laughs> no, that makes sense. So fast forward to COVID, right? I think, you know, some people might not realize we were together at the New York show March 8th, 2020. Right. And uh, as the world was shutting down and the show was shutting down and our phones were blowing up, you know, and who would have thought on that day, you know, what happened after, but talk me through those early days of COVID and how you were able to kind of stay focused, stay, you know, positive, going in the right direction in the midst of chaos. Well, you know, chaos is fun in the sense <laughs> that it's challenging. And uh, you're right. We were in New York City. We were at a, uh, you know, a convention. We were learning stuff. And you're right. Our phones were blowing up. And I think New York was the hotspot. Yes. <laughs> we were staying at hotels in Times Square and then the, not good. Not yeah. good. <laughs> so, yeah, we get back into the Poconos, which we think is the safe spot. And, uh, and we're told that, um, you know, we have to close. Barley Creek has got a, a fantastic six acre piece of property. We also have a lot of catering opportunities at Barley Creek in our backyard and our pavilion. So when we were told that uh, things were going to shut down, but you could still do to go and take out and you could eat outside, we just opened up our catering shed, put, you know, got the tents out, set up the tents moved our food truck, which was up here at the Pine Size Park, down into the main parking lot and just essentially opened up a to-go empire. We took uh, three of our three of our delivery vehicles, which, you know, one's a Suzuki, one's a Ford Transit that's almost dead. And then we've got a, a Ford Explorer that probably has some rust in it. But uh, we got car toppers for that fleet. And, uh, and then we had to interview which member of staff knows how to drive a stick ship? Right. And so all of a sudden we're delivering. Oh, and then we're like, oh, wait, I have a lot of staff and these people, you know, I want to keep them employed. How do we do this? So we heard through the grapevine that there's a shortage of hand sanitizer. <laughs> so, you know, all of a sudden repurpose our distillery and we take, uh, you know, these totes of, uh, you know, 190 proof and, uh, and get the, you know, World Health Organization formula. We go online with the uh, FDA and we get licensed to go ahead and craft our hand sanitizer, which was a nightmare, but we got it. And then all of a sudden we're, uh, you know, the local hand sanitizer uh, depot, which is fascinating because our biggest customer at that time was the Toby Hanna Army Depot. And those people are famous for repairing uh, communication devices here in this neighborhood. Right. And so, you know, we didn't have any army pickup trucks and most of the guys uh, and gals were not in uniform, but it was, it made me feel good that we were helping. Right. And our state senator would swing by and pick up a case or two of hand sanitizer and then he'd drop it off at, uh, you know, the, his favorite local nursing home. So we felt like, uh, you know, th this is good. And then every to go order, got a little bottle of hand <laughs> sanitizer. sanitizer. So, you know, I know this sounds a little crass, but uh, so, you know, as soon as the food's gone, I still have my label <laughs> on your kitchen counter saying, call me again, I got hand sanitizer. Right, so, no, it's so, so, you know, it's like, okay, how do we, how do we get past this? And by keeping everybody employed, that really helped, especially, you know, cause so we kept income coming in, but it wasn't the kind of income that we were expecting. Right. But some of the, our friends in Philadelphia, I mean, literally closed, like locked the door and, yeah. you know, hey, folks, go collect unemployment. Um, we tried very hard. And, and in fact, we succeeded in making sure that everybody stayed. Everybody who wanted to stay employed did. Right. And so, yeah, we're proud of that. Yeah. I mean, I think what's incredible is, you know, in your area or, you know, wherever you are during that time period, there were so many people who didn't see what you saw so talk to me a little bit about like the mindset that it took to to not just say we're going to close and lay everybody off i mean how did you keep your team believing that you know we really were going to come out of this because i remember when we first started looking at sales again you know maybe it was april early may of 2020 and i mean they were down you know 50 percent from prior year maybe even more than that and yet and your team always kind of kept this goal of all right, that's okay. We're going to build it back. Every week's going to get better. 
you know, we're going to get to, I think it was 75% by the end of the year. But you guys always had this vision of forward, which was incredible considering how many people just couldn't think like that. Yeah. I, you know, I have a young staff and they're, um, and all they needed was, uh, you know, a cheerleader or a coach that said, we can do this. And, you know, I went through, uh, what is it? The, um, not the great recession, but, uh, but, yeah. that, but that one was pretty interesting. And so, you know, a little bit of a wake up call had happened to me back in, uh, was it 2007? Yeah. And we were in the midst of a, a big expansion at the time. And all of a sudden the world fell apart. So we kind of went through a, a little bit of a soul searching crisis control or crisis management. And essentially that's what this was. But the beauty, if there is a beauty of this, <laughs> and there is, no. but um, this affected everyone yeah. as opposed to just that over leveraged kid back in 2007. Right, right. This one was, hey, we're all in the same boat. Let's figure out uh, what some of these other folks are doing. I'm part of the Pennsylvania Restaurant Lodging Association, mm -hmm. and one of my uh, fellow compatriots um, in this industry was making uh, plastic dividers for patrons sitting at the bar. Right, right. And so, you know, as soon as that rule came up, we were the first ones to have the coolest <laughs> plastic dividers right. that allowed us to sit at the bar. And, you know, when you're part of the, you know, a restaurant, uh, your state restaurant association, and if you're talking to these folks who, who are in the same boat as you are, you get ideas from them. Right. And some of the ideas were, okay, so you're not allowed to sit at the bar. But if the cocktail table is four inches away from the bar, right. then that would count. I don't know <laughs> who's making up these rules. So essentially, you know, I had, and you, you've met Stephanie a bunch of times. Stephanie is one of the most fantastic operators who will read, uh, you know, the, the newest set of rules coming down the pike and figure it out. I mean, today we just got a new rule. We're not allowed to sell CBD, you know, over the counter and you're not allowed to put it in alcoholic beverages, but licensed establishments were allowed to do that today. That's not the case. Right. So we're going to come up with, a, <laughs> we're, going to come, we're, going, we're, going, we're going to come up with a way because our, our friends uh, up at Pocono Organics have a, a, a really interesting empire and they're creating a, you know, CBD products and we're mixing CBD products into uh, cider. Right. Now it's a non-alcoholic cider. So that's, that's legal, but we're not allowed to sell it here at a licensed establishment. Okay. Can we still make it? <laughs> if we can still make it, who's selling it? So we're, we're going to try and figure this out. And, you know, if it doesn't work, it'll fall into that pile of sushi. <laughs> right. you know, that, that Barley Creek is more of a, uh, you know, an American restaurant, uh, burgers and cheesesteaks and food truck. And not a lot of deep fried stuff, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, we're, uh, we're always looking at what are some of the other possibilities. Right. So it's a, uh, it's a mindset of, um, yeah, you can learn from the past, but let's go to the future. Yeah. Which I think has really, you know, I think everything that you guys did during COVID has really created all of these new revenue streams for your business. And like you said, moving it forward in different directions. Cause I think even now, you know, what's interesting being in the Pocono region is you hear from a lot of business owners about, well, you know, once COVID's over, are people going to go back to New York or back to New Jersey and get on planes again? And then they're not going to be here, you know, to, to the amounts that they were here in the last couple of years. But what's interesting with you guys is you're still beating those records every week, right? You're kind of creating your own destiny, which I think is such a refreshing thing and not worrying so much about the things that, you know, we can't control, but really focusing on the things that you can, which is incredible. Well, you know, I think, um, you know, everybody out there in podcast land, you know, go get uh, Warren Buffett's book, Snowball. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you just focus in on the things that you can control and, you know, our partnership um, with the Largo Group is kind of, re you know, hammering that home. Hey, these are the things that you can control with your finances, with your numbers, with your reporting, with your inventory, with the reports that you guys are generating for us to look at. You guys, Barley Creek, can control these facets of your numbers. These, so here's what I suggest you do. So the Largo Group has helped um, tremendously with that. And you know, you read uh, you know Warren Buffett's book or anybody else's management book, for that matter. 
The goal is don't really worry about your competition. Know what they're doing, but focus in on your strengths. Go ahead and um, determine what your weaknesses are. And if they're really bad, jettison, jettison them <laughs> and, uh, and go ahead and focus in on your strengths and your core ideas and, and you know, core themes. So, yeah, the snowball is, um, I guess, the reference to, hey, when you're doing well, it kind of just grows. Yeah. The snowball gets bigger. Hopefully the quality of the snow is still good, <laughs> right. um, which, by the way, this is the last weekend of skiing at Camelback, <laughs> but that means the golf clubs come out. Right. So here we go again. Yes, exactly. So switching gears a little bit to golf. Another thing that's interesting is your mom was a phenomenal golfer, you know, very highly ranked competitively, loved playing the game. You grew up playing the game. I love golf. So how would you say that influenced you as a business owner? I think it's terrific. I mean, I like to do business with, uh, with people, uh, who play golf by the rules. <laughs> okay. So I think golf is one of the more interesting ethical sports out there, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I'm probably going to get a lot of tennis balls thrown at me, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think golf is a game of perfection and tennis is a game of mistakes. And I believe that uh, if you embrace um, golf and the spirit of golf and the rules of golf, um, you're going to be a better business operator. Yeah. Simple as that. And, uh, and you know, if, if you practice enough, you're going to get better at golf. And if you practice enough with your relationships with your vendors, you know, with your staff, with the community and, and, and maybe your investors, you know, in that order, so to speak. You're probably going to do well in business and you probably will get invited to a lot more golf outings. <laughs> right. <laughs> Definitely if you play by the rules. Yeah. Yes. Right. There's, there's nothing worse than, you know, having a nickname left foot. Right. right. No, no. <laughs> All right. Well, so what do you think is, you know, on the path for the next five years? If you could go five years out, what do you see for Barley Creek? I would like to, uh, I, you know, in terms of uh, Barley Creek, I'd like to, create about five more Stephs and Steph is one the operator. I'd like, um, I'd like Steph to go ahead and figure out, you know, how do we grow responsibly because we have the talent pool to go ahead and grow. So if, if there's another uh, way to go ahead and double sales without uh, taking that much of a risk, because our systems are in place, our procedures are in place, we're having fun. We've got a group uh, willing to take on the uh, responsibility and the accountability, then let's grow um, yeah. and let's figure out what to do. Now, Barley Creek uh, just bought the barn across the street. We've got two pieces of property down the road that currently are now um, like a VRBO or short-term rental. Quite frankly, because we own a restaurant, there's no reason to believe that they're, they aren't bed and breakfasts. Right. So, I mean, I think we just went into the bed and breakfast <laughs> business and we're tweaking that. One of my original limited partners that we bought out, he and I, uh, our respective spouses just bought a hundred acre property, not far from where we live and not far from Barlow Creek. So we might see a winery. We might see oh, yeah. a catering facility. We might see a larger um, uh, distillery because I think uh, RTDs or ready to drink cocktails yeah. is, is gonna be a little bit bigger almost every day. I think this week we're launching a transfusion in a uh, 12 ounce oh. can. We've already got, uh, I think it was called a Moscow mule, but I think we're going to call it Monroe mule. <laughs> so I think the Monroe mule is uh, going to get a new label. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I think one of my favorites is our, uh, our Pocono punch yeah. and the Pocono punch is, um, you know, it's great. It's great. It's a vodka punch <laughs> right. in a can. So, you know, you take that anywhere you want. Yeah. So in terms of growth, boy, we have a lot of ideas and I just hope our bankers can keep up with it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, you know, you mentioned the Warren Buffett books. Are there any other books that you have been reading recently or in the past that you draw on for inspiration? I do like reading historical accounts of Thomas Edison was one of my favorites. I know a thousand ways how not to make a light bulb. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, so, you know, anytime you can read, uh, you know, historical books on uh, what some inventors, 
I do enjoy, um, you know, reading a couple of uh, the restaurant books, Danny Myers, Setting the Table, yeah. Anthony Bourdain. I do find myself hooked on, uh, you know, diners, drives and dives. <laughs> to dive, dive. And I think that's kind of fun. And then I, I find myself fascinated with the motivational speakers and, uh, and any chance I can, uh, you know, go to a convention and not go onto the, onto the floor and look at equipment and maybe go into a seminar where, you know, somebody is saying, this is what we did, you know, to turn the company around. Case studies are some of my favorite and Harvard does it. Babson, um, entrepreneurial school extraordinaire. You know, when you can go ahead and read about somebody else's trials, tribulations, successes or failures, if you can pick up a gem so yeah. that you can avoid it or repeat it, you know, in terms of reading voracious when it comes to, uh, you know, the restaurant uh, business magazines, national restaurant magazines, because yeah. there's always some story about, uh, you know, what that operator did who opened up instead of uh, closing during COVID. They opened up uh, 12 ghost kitchens right. and became the biggest uh, to go barbecue place <laughs> in Southern California. Okay, great. How, right. how do we do that? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so in terms of reading, um, I guess the answer is you can never go wrong if you invest in yourself in a continuing education. Yeah. No, I think that's so true. Right. So, well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an awesome conversation and best of luck to Barley Creek in the future. Thanks, Anne. Thanks to the Largo Group.